Hi, everyone. My name is Leora Horwitz. I'm a general internist and I direct the Center for Healthcare Innovation and Delivery Science at NYU Langone Health. And I'm going to talk today about a clinician's perspective on machine learning in healthcare. A learning healthcare system is a system in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and innovation with best practices seamlessly embedded in the delivery process, patients and families active participants in all elements, and new knowledge captured as an integral byproduct of the delivery experience. This is the aspiration that all of us have in healthcare. We would like to create and to work in learning healthcare systems. And one of the goals of machine learning in healthcare is to help us achieve this. So the question is, how does that work? How can machine learning help us to create a, a learning health system? Well, the first thing I wanna emphasize is that we do not have a problem of data. We are in fact drowning in data. We have ample data to make use of. The challenge that we have in healthcare is that we're not very good at transforming that data into a usable form, into knowledge, making sense out of the patterns. And that of course is what we always hope that machine learning will help us with. So in order to help you understand what a clinician wants out of machine learning, I want to back up and um, show you how clinicians think. I uh, work in the hospital as a hospitalist, and very often a medical student will come and present a case to me. And at the end, they'll say things like this. This is a 60 year old man with a history of hypertension, high blood pressure on three medications, last systolic blood pressure 175, high cholesterol with an LDL of 165, diabetes with an A1C of 8.9 and gap and enlarged prostate. And he's coming in with three days of chest pressure that is worse while going upstairs and resolves after several minutes of rest. This is a typical example of a string of data elements. There is no synthesis here. There's no judgment. There's no additional thought that has gone into it. This is a whole bunch of facts. Now, they happen to be very pertinent and interrelated facts. And I know why the medical student is selecting to tell me these facts. I know what the medical student is probably thinking, but the medical student is not actually synthesizing these, fact, these facts into a pattern, into a diagnosis. Whereas a senior physician will take that same patient and will say, this is a 60 year old man with multiple uncontrolled cardiac risk factors, who's presenting with three days of typical angina. So what has the physician done here? She or he has taken all of these facts, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol, and has said for this patient, it's not so important exactly what the risk factors are. The reason I care about the hypertension and the diabetes and the high cholesterol is because all of those raise my concern for the likelihood of severe cardiac disease. And you notice, I didn't even mention the gout and the prostate and the whatever, because they don't matter. For this patient, those are red herrings. The student says, this person is coming in with three days of chest pressure that resolves on rest, which is a fact pattern. That is a pattern consistent of typical angina. I can synthesize that and just say typical angina. I don't need to repeat all those facts. So what a master clinician does is they take all of those facts and they transform them into a pattern. And of course, that is exactly what we want machine learning to do. We want to take all of those trees and turn them into a picture of a forest, a landscape that we understand. And machine learning is in fact designed for that. That's what machine learning is good at. It's good at taking facts and turning them into patterns. But I don't actually need a machine learning model to tell me that this 60 year old guy is at a very high risk of heart disease. I know that already. Even my third year med student knows that already. Much more often, the case that I have is something like this. This is a 50 year old man with well controlled high blood pressure, with high cholesterol on a high dose of statins, so on treatment, presenting with three days of chest pain at rest. This is an ambiguous case. We have a person who has some risk factors. He's 50, he's male, he's got comorbidities, but they're well controlled. He's not super old. He's coming in with an atypical pattern of chest pain. He might have just pulled a muscle. Chest pain at rest, usually benign. Or he has heart disease that's so bad that he's having chest pain because of his heart disease at rest. That person needs an intervention immediately. So I'm stuck here with 
totally benign, you pull the muscle, go home and take some Advil, or I need to send you to the cath lab immediately. Much more often, those are the cases that we are dealing with. We deal with ambiguity all the time. And that's where, in principle, machine learning could be the most valuable, because there may be lots of other facts hidden in the, in the data that I haven't even noticed yet. What I would do with a patient like this is I would seek out more facts. I would seek out more data. I would talk to the patient more. I would get more history. I would look at some lab results. I would look at some uh, electrocardiogram. I would collect more data, but perhaps there is data already in the health record that I'm not noticing. That's really where we want machine learning to help, to take collectively all of these fact patterns and help us understand what our risks are, what our patients are, what the stories are, what the trajectories are, and so on. My dad is a pediatrician, and he had this poster up in his office forever when I was a kid. This is a poster of 99 dogs. And just like I showed you that typical case of a 60-year-old a uh, man with multiple cardiac risk factors, there's lots of things in here that look very obviously like dogs. And I take it as a given that any machine learning model that makes it past you know, stage one will be very good at identifying obvious dogs in a poster of dogs. But as I said before, most of the time, I don't really want a machine learning model to do that. I already can recognize that this is a dog. On the other hand, there's things like this in the red circle here in this poster. Well, I don't really know what this thing is. I take it that it's a dog because it's on this poster. I want your machine learning model to help me recognize that this is, in fact, a dog. But I also want one other thing from your model. I want you to help me find the cat. This is a poster of 99 dogs and one cat. And very often, we have situations where we see chest pain after chest pain after chest pain and you know cardiac disease after cardiac disease after cardiac disease but one of those chest pains is actually a blood clot in the lung and i might miss that what i want your machine learning model to help me with is to identify the anomalies the things that i might otherwise miss the cases that are different the masqueraders that look like something but are really something else that i might miss do you see any of you see the cat there's the cat. OK, so in practice, when machine learning models are applied, the reasons often that they fail are as follows. All they do is tell me that things like this are dogs. I already know that. I don't need a model to tell me things that are patently obvious most of the time. Or it's not right any more than I am about these ambiguous cases. If you're not going to help me with the ambiguous cases and you're just going to tell me the obvious ones, I don't need your model. Or worst of all, it tells me that this thing is a dog when very obviously this thing is a cat. It tells me that somebody who has a respiratory rate of 100 is desperately ill, whereas I know that you can't have a respiratory rate of 100, and that's a person who has a respiratory rate of 10 that somebody accidentally added a zero to. Machine learning models in particular seem susceptible to this junk data, garbage in, garbage out, things that clinicians will recognize right away as just wrong or improbable or, or blood from the wrong patient, machine learning models can get fooled by. And those are situations where I see that, I see a ridiculous output from the model, and then I stop trusting all of the output from the model. So I really don't want you to tell me that a cat is a dog. So that's well known, I think, and I, I think that everyone who makes models understands this. But I wanna now talk about some other things that I see often kind of going wrong with machine learning models that get built for clinical practice. The first thing that happens is that people talk all the time about the receiver operator curve or the area under the receiver operator curve, the C statistic, however you want to define it, which is very simply a measure of the sensitivity up on the y-axis versus one minus the specificity, or in other words, the true positive rate of all the people with disease X, how many patients does your model identify correctly as having disease X versus the false positive rate? Of all the people who do not have disease X, how many people does your model incorrectly say does have the disease? And you can, you can graph that in and get an output. And, and very often I see machine learning models that are very proud of the fact that they have a very high uh, ROC curve. And this is in fact very valuable for determining on a population level how effective this model uh, will be. How well does this model discriminate 
between disease and no disease, outcome and no outcome. But for me as a clinician, this is not helpful because what I want to know is if I'm looking at a patient in front of me and your model says this patient has disease X, what I want to know is what's the likelihood that that positive test is a real positive test in my patient? In other words, what's the positive predictive value of that positive? What is the positive rate, correct, the true positive rate over all of the positives, not over all of the patients with disease? Because I don't know all the patients with disease. What I have is a patient in front of me and I want to know how many patients uh, how many times a positive is a true positive. So the reason that the area under the receiver operator curve is not helpful for that is it doesn't incorporate that problem at all. And the reason it doesn't incorporate that is because it is totally independent of prevalence. So whether I have one patient in 10 or one patient in 1,000 with disease, the receiver operator curve will look exactly the same. And yet the likelihood that I'm going to get a false positive or a true positive will be very different in those two circumstances. I care about how your model performs given the prevalence in the patient population that I am dealing with. And the area under the receiver operator curve will not help me with that. So I'm going to walk you through an example I often give to my students, just in case this is not so clear to you. Let's imagine that you have a model and you've built it to predict for me who, is, who has diabetes or who was about to have diabetes. And let's say we run it on a thousand patients and your model is amazing. It has 99% sensitivity, it has 99% specificity. It is really good at discriminating disease from not disease. And I know that in the US population, the prevalence of diabetes is about 10%. So if I apply this model to a random sampling of patients that represent the US population, then I'm gonna expect that there would be uh, about uh, 100 patients out of my 1,000 who have disease and about 900 patients who do not have disease. And my model is amazing. So of my 100 patients who have disease, it will correctly identify 99 as having uh, diabetes and it will get one wrong. And of the 900 patients that do not have diabetes, again, it will identify 99% of them as not having diabetes, that's 891, and it will get nine of them wrong. But again, I'm looking at a positive test in front of me, and I want to know how likely is that positive test going to reflect actual diabetes. So I'm interested in the proportion of the positive tests that are true positive. So that's 99 over 108, or 91.7%. Pretty good. So I'm very likely to believe your model output. Note, it's not 99% or 100%. I'm not always still i shouldn't always trust that model it's still going to be wrong more often than your amazing sensitivity and specificity would suggest because of the prevalence of disease now let's suppose instead i have a similar amazing model and i it's instead trying to predict how likely someone is to have hiv I'm going to run it on a thousand patients. It has 99% sensitivity. It has 99% specificity, but the prevalence of HIV in the global US population is about 0.4%. So if I run this on a thousand patients, it, there will be about four out of a thousand that have HIV. And my model being 99% sensitive will find almost all of them, 3.96 of them, it will call positive and it'll be wrong you know, on 0.04 of them, very minimal. I'm left with 996 patients. Again, 99% of them, my model is gonna say correctly, do not have disease, 986, it will get 10 wrong. But now you can see that the proportion of true positives is now much lower relative to all of the positives because the prevalence of disease is so low. In fact, my positive predictive value now is only 28%. Despite your spectacular area under the receiver operator curve, your 99% sensitivity, your 99% specificity, the positive predictive value of this test is 28%. Seven out of 10 times, it will be wrong. And for me as a clinician, if I'm using your model and I can see that seven out of 10 times it is wrong, I will not trust your model. I don't want that model. That is not a useful model in practice. And I see people ignoring this all the time. When you build a model, you need to think about how will it be applied in practice? What's the prevalence of this disease in practice? So 
I, I went back and looked for the most recent AI paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, our, our premier medical journal. Uh, this is the most recent one, it's from April. It's looking at artificial intelligence to detect papilledema from ocular fundus photographs. And you will see that it shows here um, in the results section, what they describe is the area under the curve, 0.99, incredible. It's spectacularly good. Even in the external data set, the area under the curve is 0.96, really good. Can't get much better than that since to be 96%. But nationally, the annual incidence of papilledema in the US is about 0.9 per 100,000 people. That's 0.0009%, right? So if I run this model arbitrarily on whoever shows up in my office for uh, an ocular fundus exam, it will be wrong almost all the time, even though it has an area under the curve of 0.96. I would be foolish to implement this model in an all-purpose general practice ophthalmology clinic. I would really only want it to be running when I have a high pretest probability suspicion that this person has papilledema, which I only see in the case of brain swelling. I have to be worried that this person has like a big brain tumor or a big bleed or a big stroke or something really bad going on in there in order for me to want to run this model at all. And nowhere in this paper does it talk about things like that. So I want you not to make these mistakes. Instead, what is useful when implementing a machine learning model in practice is the precision recall curve. So this is basically flipping the uh, receiver operator curve a little bit, we now have on the x-axis the sensitivity, which they call recall. And on the y-axis, we now have the positive predictive value, the precision, exactly what I want to know as a clinician. We created a machine learning model, for example, that predicts how likely someone is to die in the next two months. So in our case, that would be of all the patients who die, how many do, I, do we identify? That's the sensitivity versus how often are we right? That's the positive predicted value. The reason this is valuable is that we usually need to set a threshold for implementation. Again, something people don't talk very much about, the machine learning models. I don't really want some number to get spit out at me. I don't know what to do with 0.251. What's effective usually in practice is to set some kind of threshold and above that threshold to do something to alert somebody, to set something in motion, to have an intervention. Again, I don't want your model unless it's gonna change my practice in some way. So we have to set a threshold. And where we set the threshold is highly dependent on what we wanna do with the output. What's the intervention? So for example, if my intervention is going to be that I ask the primary care doctor to do some counseling with the patient try to find out what their goals of care are, make sure that they have a healthcare proxy appointed, talk about a living will, then I probably wanna set my threshold pretty low. I, in other words, I don't need to be right all the time. If I'm wrong a bunch of the time, the patient doesn't die in the next two months, it's not that much harm done, right? It cost me a few minutes of my time. The patient maybe created a healthcare proxy and didn't need one in the next two months. Well, that's okay. Everyone should have one anyway. I have one and I'm hopefully not gonna die in the next two months. So the cost of the intervention is low. The cost of being wrong is very low. Potential benefit of being right is high. So in such a situation, you might set the threshold very low, a positive predictive value threshold very low. On the other hand, if my intervention based on this model is going to be a uh, you know, enrolling the patient in hospice, telling the patient that maybe we should not start that next round of chemo, refusing to start dialysis, um, engaging palliative care, well, then I want my positive predictive value threshold to be very high. I do not want to make too many mistakes in a situation where I'm withholding care or really making people change major decision making and, and plans based on a model that might be wrong. So for example, if this model Let's suppose our intervention is going to be the more aggressive kind. We're going to have a conversation about goals of care. We're going to really rethink our interventions. We're going to maybe not um, do anything too aggressive. Then let's say we want it really high. We want to be right like eight out of 10 times if we're going to do something like that. If I set my threshold there, I only capture 7.5% of all deaths. So the other thing to be really sort of cognizant about when making a machine learning model 
is to think about how, what proportion of the population is this going to apply to at the threshold that you set? And is that an appropriate or acceptable amount? Is it good enough for me to only apply this intervention to 7.5% of all the people who go on to die? Maybe I decide that's not really enough. I, I, I want to offer this intervention to more people. So maybe I say, okay, listen, I'll, I want to be right three out of four times, three out of four times. And I'm going to say to the patient, listen, like 75% of patients like you, they don't make it more than two months, right? So they know that I'm not always right, but they know it's very high risk. Well, then I can catch 13% of my patients and so on and so forth. So in thinking about thresholding, precision recall curves are very helpful to think about uh, how we're going to organize things. So again, these will help me set my decision-making threshold for my patient population, because that's what drives the positive predictive value, and my use case, because that determines how willing I am to be wrong. So again, this depends on underlying prevalence. It depends on the burden of the intervention I'm choosing. It depends on the cost of being wrong, in other words, a false positive. It depends on the cost of missing cases, in other words, a false negative. All of these things go into play when I'm deciding how to apply a machine learning model. But what you also should be asking me is, aren't you just giving me now the obvious ones, the obvious dogs? If somebody's 80% likely to die in the next two months, do I really need a machine learning model for that? Isn't this my 60-year-old guy with multiple cardiac risk factors coming in with typical angina? I don't need a model for that. So you have to look and see in practice, what are people doing at this threshold? And do you think that at this threshold, with this patient population that you would catch, your intervention will make a difference? So this is the group that um, actually made this model, Vincent Major, Yindo and Apinyanapal. And um, when uh, they developed this, this model, we looked kind of behind the scenes. We didn't show it to anybody. We ran it for a while. And we looked to see what happened to those patients at the 80% at the 75% threshold, the ones who should be really obvious. Well, it turned out that only a quarter of them had any documentation of any discussion about advanced care planning, about what people might want to happen to them in the next few months, even though presumably these patients were very obvious. And so that was sufficient for us to say, all right, we should implement this in real life. We should turn this on and give people this alert because obviously they're not behaving the way we want them to behave, even on these, the small subset of what should be obvious patients. And so we have an alert in the electronic health record that is set at the 75% threshold. And all it says is this patient has been identified by our model as having a very high risk of death within the next two months. Do you agree? And if you agree, think about what you're doing with this patient. Think about having an advanced care planning conversation. Think about consulting geriatrics. No, there's nothing required here. There's no hard stop. We don't force everybody to be DNR. We don't send them all to hospice. We just say to people, stop. Think about this patient for a minute. And in the first two, 10 weeks that we ran this model, it fired 30 times on 18 patients. And by the time those patients left the hospital or died, 83% of them had had an advanced care planning discussion documented. And five times the doctor said, I don't believe you. I think the patient's actually going to be okay. But four of those patients died in the next 60 days. So in this case, even if these were obvious, it seemed to make a difference. Sometimes even identifying the obvious cases is useful. And it could be that those are in high stakes situation like this, where I might be pretty confident that this patient is not doing well, but it takes a lot of confidence for me to really want to sit down with a patient and a family and say that. And so perhaps the model gave them that extra bit of confidence that it's not just me thinking this. I'm not just, you know, a, a cynic. I'm not just a pessimist. Actually, no, this patient is really high risk. I should have this conversation. The problem that we have, though, with just turning models on like that is that we're never really sure if it's the model itself that made a difference or something else. And in fact, when we later went back and looked at all the patients across the hospital in this time period, we found that um, the rate of advanced care planning discussions went up across the board, even for the ones that were not alerted. And there were other interventions at the same time going on. So the only way to really tell if a model is changing practice is to implement it in a randomized fashion so that you can really see on a random assignment, 
whether the intervention is changing people's behavior. And so we've implemented a rapid randomized trial lab at NYU that does dozens of very uh, quick turnaround, randomized trials of operational things like implementing a machine learning model, not testing drug A versus drug B, but testing change in practice, trying to get people to do what we already know as best practice. And we wrote about it uh, in the New England Journal. You can take a look. So what is a systems randomized trial? These are pragmatic clinical trials, similar to, um, to pragmatic trials. They we like them to have a high volume of events so that we can uh, get results pretty quickly. We like for the outcome to be short term for the same reason. It needs to be easily measurable. In fact, it needs to be already routinely collected because we do not want to add extra work to any of the frontline staff. We want it to just be seamlessly embedded in the way that people do their jobs. And there needs to be a feasible randomization scheme. And it turns out that this set of criteria work very well often for implementing machine learning models. So the next time one came around, we, uh, uh, we implemented it in a randomized fashion. Here, um, we were asked to build a model for, uh, or we, we decided to build a model for COVID patients to try to determine who was at low risk of having an adverse event in the next 96 hours. And we did this because we had this brand new disease. We had no idea, no clinical intuition. My master clinician and my third year med student were the same with this disease because we, none of us had any idea what to expect. We didn't know how quickly people were going to get better, were gonna get sick. We didn't know what, to ex uh, what kind of complications they had. And that meant it was hard for us to send them home. But we in New York were at the epicenter of this epidemic. We were drowning in COVID patients. Our entire hospital turned into a COVID hospital. We needed to discharge patients to make space in our hospital. And so we built this uh, uh, machine learning model. Nargis Rezavian uh, built it along with Vincent and Yindalan. And it has a spectacularly good AUC 0.95. We're very pleased with that. But again, not so helpful for actual practice. So this is the precision recall curve for this specific model. Um, the red line is the parsimonious model that we ultimately ended up using. So again, here, we have to decide where to set the threshold. Where do we say to people, this patient's at really low risk of an adverse event, you can send them home. Again, as with all things, it's a judgment call. So we look to see, well, what's our usual readmission rate? What's the usual rate at which we get this wrong? We send someone home, they turn out to be sick and I have to come back around 10% or so. So we said, okay, if we set our positive predicted value at 10%, and actually for these patients, it's even higher. It's like 15% usually for medicine. So if we set it at 10% and we get it wrong one out of 10 times, that's like within the bounds of current practice, usual experience. So that's an acceptable rate of error. Okay, so if we set it at 90%, how many patients who are not gonna have an adverse event do we identify? And the answer is a lot of them, more than half, 53%. So that's a good uh, threshold to set. And then we did one other thing, which I didn't mention earlier, but is also important. We looked to see, well, if we do that, how many patients are going to alert? Because we never want a, a, to set a threshold where it's just gonna fire for everybody, then it's not useful for anybody. And it fires about 45% of the time. The proportion of patients reaching that threshold is about 45%, which is good. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna alert everybody that, uh, that they're safe to go home, we're gonna actually be sooner. Again, you should be asking yourself, is it obvious who is going to do well? Uh, do we need the machine learning model for that? Um, so we looked and saw that 78% of the patients that were being discharged did achieve a green score, so that's good. So that means that clinicians are in fact uh, using similar sorts of criteria in their heads um, for discharging patients. This is without showing them uh, the model. Um, and again, is it is our model only identifying the obvious ones? We look to see when does the model first get to a green threshold? And the answer is that it first got to the green threshold 3.2 days before the patient actually was discharged. So it's not just identifying the super obvious ones, at least. It was not obvious enough to the doctors at that time to send them home. It said identifying perhaps those ambiguous cases before they become super obvious. And so we implemented it in the electronic health record. You can see the picture on the right here. Um, this is where, this is a patient list um, of patients with COVID and here are some scores. But you'll see that there are patients who don't have scores. Those scores are hidden. 
And that's because those are the patients that get randomized into the I'm not showing you the results uh, arm. And we make that very clear to the end user. We say this is hidden. It's not that there's no data. It's not that these patients are green. It's not this not applicable. There is a score. We're just not telling you what it is. And that way people do not make the mistake of assuming that the patient is particularly ill or particularly well if they are using it. So it's been running now uh, for a couple of months. And uh, when we get to our sufficient sample size, we will unblind it and take a look and see, does this actually help uh, doctors discharge patients a little bit earlier, making space in the hospital? So I'm basically asking you as machine learning modelers to walk this tough tightrope. I don't want you to only show me cases that are patently obvious because then I don't need your model. And I really don't want you to tell me cases that are just absurdly incorrect because then I throw your model away. What I really want you to do is help me find those cases I might overlook, the rare cats among the dogs. And I want you to help me figure out what to do with these atypical cases so that I recognize how sick or not sick they are. The Predictive Analytics Unit at NYU has built all these models and many more besides. All I do is come along and complain about them as a clinician. So I really want to give credit to all these guys here. Um, Yin Afanyanapong in the center is the director of this unit. Thank you for your time.